welcome to a, another podcast. And Josh and Mara and I here, are here to discuss Elijah a little bit. And so I uh, want you to give us a little bit of a series background, Mara. All right, so this month the series is called Amazed, and I've been making the kids, every time I say the word amazing, they've got to do like the spirit fingers, <laughs> which they're Let's loving. What is that? Spirit fingers? Amazing. They call it jazz hands. Oh, jazz hands? Okay. <laughs> I have spirit what? fingers. So, but yeah. it's just like one of those words, like you hear it and it just, I feel like it, it evokes a response from us. But we're talking about Elijah, and I um, want to make sure that we're making sure that Elijah isn't so much who was amazing, but through Elijah we see some really amazing ways that God is choosing to interact with his people. Through, through the voice of a prophet, he's choosing to interact with Elijah. So we're going to see some really um, really interesting ways that God speaks in, in a whisper, not in a roar. He is um, there to kind of show his his power and presence over um, these false gods. And I think Elijah is just a really interesting character to see how in the midst of some really hard times in his life, he was not a popular guy. He was um, kind of exiled himself, and he was in hiding for a lot of his um, a lot of his time. But how God was still kind of faithful and working in some kind of unexpected ways, even through that time. Yeah. And so we're in First Kings. Josh, why don't you give us a background of that? Yeah, First Kings seventeen is where we were at on Sunday, and uh, so this introduces Elijah. Elijah as uh, a prophet of God, which means that God spoke through him. And I, I just this is pointless to point out, but I think verse one is is funny elijah the tishbite from tishbe that's just the tishbite from tishbe i wish i was josh the the mary's villian from marysville yeah anyway again <laughs> you're the ross <laughs> the rossite from ross yes millville millvillian Millville. anyway what are we talking about elijah prophet uh god uh he kind of comes onto the scene by announcing that there's going to be a drought uh and a famine for the next few years and so that's always a great start to your your prophecy is uh, dropping a bomb like that. Like it's going to be really bad for the next few years. Uh, in the process, um, God essentially uh, instructs Elijah to wait, to wait on, uh, wait for this time to pass, and to do that next to this this stream or this creek. Uh, and God promises to provide for him. And uh, and so as he's waiting by this stream, he obviously drinks from the stream, and then he gets his food from ravens, uh, which is is weird. Mm. Uh, but the the stream eventually uh, runs dry, like everything else. And so then God once again uh, provides for Elijah, and the way that uh, he does that is through a widow. Uh, and so God instructs Elijah to ask this widow to to kind of provide his food and water for him. He does that. The widow is. Uh, obviously a little bit hesitant to do that. She has a son that she is taking care of. Uh, it's drought, it's famine. She hardly has enough and she even says as much, basically I have enough for one more loaf of bread. And, and Elijah says, that's good, I'll take it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, but, but then with this promise that uh, if, you, if you provide for me, my God will provide for you and basically give you just enough to get you through uh, this, this famine. And so, uh, so that's happening. He's getting his, his food and water from her. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, this widow's son, uh, gets really sick and dies. And so, uh, she is upset, obviously, but she kind of is upset at Elijah. She kind of, um, attaches this bad thing that's happening to her son to Elijah being there and kind of, uh, so, so her anger is toward Elijah. Uh, basically, why are you here? You caused my son to die and that kind of thing. And then we see, once again, God providing and God kind of taking care. Um, and and basically, Elijah brings this child back to life. And so uh, the, the chapter ends with the, the woman saying to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting things in that passage that, that the thing that really stands out to me or one of the things that really stands out to me is Elijah says, it will not rain except on my word. In other words, there's there's a little bit of a, God has given him some authority mm. in this and and some partnership with God in in, in this drought. A um, lot, lot of things. What what do you see in the in the passage that stands out to you? Anything? Well, I thought that um, that thing you did on Sunday was so cool with the whole like <laughs> it pours out, but then like there's always like just enough. Yeah. And like I think that that's such an interesting thing here because he didn't she didn't miraculously have enough 
oil and, and flour mm. to make lots of food. Yeah. It wasn't that she couldn't see the plenty. She couldn't see mm. the the promise fulfilled. It was just day by day, which made yeah. me think about when Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray. It's give us each day our daily right. bread. And so like a lot of my mind was just wrapping around this idea that like, it's amazing how God can take care of us day to day. We don't always need to see what's happening mm. next. And even I was talking with the kids about what do we need each day? What are the things we need? And it's almost hard sometimes to think of all the things that we need each day because those needs are met. Like, and we don't realize right. sometimes the things that we need until we feel like that need isn't being met. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, God's providence is never, never meant to be like an extra, ex, I can't even say the word, extravagant amount. It's, yeah, I love that. It's just, just enough to get by. And not even, uh, what I love, it's not even enough to get her through to the end of the famine. It's right. each day there's new providence um, that that eventually gets her through that that famine. Which, yeah. So my my thinking there is like that doesn't take it doesn't take a lot of faith in God's providence when we have so mm-hmm. much that mm-hmm. you know I'm I'm good for a long time. You know what I mean? Yeah. That doesn't require a whole lot of faith. Yeah, but hers did. Right, and she had to just kind of keep getting up each day and doing those ordinary things. Like yep. she would every day have to get up and make the bread right. just for that day. And go to bed that night trusting that tomorrow she would be able to get up and continue sure. in that, yeah. kind of in that waiting, just waiting for the famine to be over, just doing each day the next thing. Yeah, and there's the, the providence of God in that, that, mm-hmm. that I don't think that we always recognize. Um, you know, we, we recognize the big but do we recognize the providence of the God of caring for us day to day? Mm-hmm. And and sure. I think there's an, you know I think this story is wanting us to see. Listen, God is day by day mm-hmm. taking care of your needs. Right. And um, when we ignore that, I think we ignore that to our peril. Mm-hmm. Then you know our focus, and, and I think it's a natural tendency, particularly in a time like this. We we've all got ideals of what needs to happen. Yeah, but the fact that God took care of us today mm-hmm. should be enough. Yeah. Um, you know, Dan Walters, we do those uh, communions at, at Tri-County, and I always, I do them with him, and people come to the altar, and we did family communions at Christmas Eve, mm-hmm. yeah. and Dan would always say, well, you made it another year, <laughs> <laughs> and, and sometimes yeah, that's enough, that's right, yeah. you know, I, I made sure. it another year, I don't know, I don't know what tomorrow's going to be, I don't know yeah. what next week's going to be like, or next year, but all I know is, God, you have taken care of me to this point, and I'm going to be thankful for that. Right. Mm-hmm. And yeah. and I think there's a lot of that in this story. That's good. What else you see? Well, I pointed it out on Sunday morning, the, kind of the next-gen moment. I just love how God constantly uses just kind of the, the ordinary person. Like Elijah's obviously the big hero of the story and, uh, and, and that kind of thing. But just I just love how God places these ordinary people and uses them in significant ways i just i think that's a that's a huge reminder uh and it's it's encouraging to see those people being used by god he's Uh, a gentile yeah for sure and and someone who like the fact that she's a widow like in this society a a female's kind of status or position was based on her husband right and so for her to be a widow basically just she was someone who was kind of forgotten about and, and had no status really. Um, and, and this is, it's not unique to this, this story at all. This is, that's what God does. So, um, Just looking up, and I don't know. Is a raven a clean or an unclean animal? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. I guess if you're a Cincinnati Bengals fan, you probably say it's an <laughs> unclean Baltimore. But I also think it's kind of interesting because we think of Elijah as being like the the lead character in here, and that for a lot of the story, he's kind of at the mercy mm. of the um, providence of other people. Yeah. Like he's at the mercy sure. of, of the stream and, and the God sending the ravens. He's <clears throat> being provided for by this this widow. Which part of me goes, man, to think about if you walk into a town, who are you gonna? pick on like a poor widow with her son right, like yeah. those are the people that you think oh no they need the protection yeah. they need the so yeah. i just think it's interesting that 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 was who who god had sent him to and um chose to use that raven's unclean unclean interesting so he uses an unclean 
bird to feed him. <laughs> Don't eat the bird. He uses a Gentile woman, he, a Gentile woman he yeah, would right, not right, even right. associate yeah. with yeah. to sure. sustain him. Which is funny because like that stuff, that kind of stuff typically comes through in the New Testament, right? Like mm. uh, we think, oh, New Testament, that's when all of this unclean and clean kind of was. But <laughs> it's right here in, in the Old Testament as well. These, right. Yeah, these kind of glimpses of breaking that down. And then sustaining someone he was not being sustained by this widow, God was sustaining the widow. Yeah. And, it, you know, that's the amazing thing. Then pe the people in Jesus' hometown get so bent out of shape because he particularly mentions, because they're asking for a miracle, and he goes, well, Elijah could have done miracles in his hometown, but he didn't. He went to some widow hmm. in, in Sidon, and, and, and they wanted to kill Jesus for saying that. So it's, 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 it's an interesting it's interesting. It's ordinary, but not only is it ordinary, it's um, unexpected. Yeah. It, it's not who, you know, if, if he's being fed by doves, yeah, but, right. but ravens, if he's being right. fed uh, by, by some Jewish widow, yeah. but mm -hmm. it's some Gentile widow, yeah. and, and God's using her to sustain Elijah. That's, that parallel, well, just with Jesus, it just made me think of another parallel there. Um, we read in the New Testament that, Kind of Jesus's ministry was funded and supported by women, right? Like they, they yeah. were the provider. They were the kind of the ones that that made it possible for him to do that that ministry. Again, still in a context where um, where they didn't have status, but pretty fascinating. And some of those women, you know, I, I believe some of them were connected to Caesar's household yep. or to the the, mm -hmm. the Gentiles. Yeah. occupiers yeah and so you know there's there's a question where, where if some of the funding did not come <laughs> oh absolutely um, even in that way too yeah, one of, one of, I, I can't remember her name now but her husband was like the keeper of of caesar's palace so you yeah. know that yeah. you know that there's some access to some uh to some funds there <laughs> which is awesome yeah subversion yeah. well we talked a lot about waiting um <clears throat> and um tomorrow or sunday we're going to talk about going Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but, but we talked more about waiting. Are you guys good waiters or bad waiters? Are you, Mara, you you're probably a patient. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> when I first read this, I was like a good waiter. I was like, well, I've never worked at a restaurant. I like to think <laughs> I'd be a good waitress. But um, I mean, when it comes to waiting, of course you're like sitting there going like, well, I prayed for patience, but I didn't want to get it this way. <laughs> but so I I don't know. I I feel like I. I've had probably good seasons of waiting. Those times where it's like, okay, I, I'm just, I'm fine. But other times, I think it depends on what I'm waiting for. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm just, if I'm just waiting to be waiting, like, oh, like, but if I know what I'm waiting for, I think it's a lot more tempting to, to try to rush things, to try to get there faster. To... Yeah. Well, let's ask it this way. You guys go to a restaurant, you go to Roosters and it's Saturday night and they say the wait is 25 minutes. Do you stay or go? Oh, I have no problem staying. I'll yeah. Wait. 25 minutes, okay, th there's a lot of factors that go into this. 25 minutes for roosters, yeah, I'd wait that. But, like, my my, my length of willingness to stay is directly uh, related to the, the quality of the food. So if it was, like, 45 minutes for roosters, no. no so so you, you're you in those lines around canes uh, uh, that, that yeah, since they don't open probably. up. So, for instance, Schmitz. A lot of times on the weekend, Schmitz has an hour, hour okay. and 20-minute wait. I would wait for that. I don't even know is. It's a German, in, uh, German restaurant in Columbus. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, Change really good food. I will. I'll wait for. I'll wait for a long time. My dream. This is totally off topic. One of my dreams is to go to um, Austin, Texas, to Franklin Barbecue, and you basically have to get there at six in the morning and wait till they start serving at like eleven, and uh, and then they just sell out. And so if you're not there by six, you're not going to get barbecue. Oh, I would. Gosh. I would totally wait for five hours for. For good barbecue like that. Huh. Yeah. Why are we talking? What? Are you a good waiter, Paul? <laughs> no. <laughs> we all, yeah, we don't even have to ask the question. 25 minutes, I'm at Chipotle. <laughs> the McDonald's drive through Let's go. Yeah. See, see, but some of mine is like, okay, if, if we go in there, we've already gotten all the kids out of the car. And so to oh, go yeah. somewhere else, I'm like, well, I don't know if I could get the kids in the car and get somewhere else right. within 25, 25 minutes, minutes just to find out that there might be another wait somewhere That's else. Legit. So I'm just like, cool your jets. We'll just sit and wait. We'll like, yeah, 25, yeah. 25 minutes is not bad That's to wait like, for yeah. a... 
That's totally, all right, all right. totally reasonable. So you guys are better at waiting, <laughs> not better waiters or waitresses. Yes. You're you might, better at you waiting that. than I am. I, I will acknowledge I am <laughs> weight impaired. And anybody who's worked with Paul already knew that. <laughs> well, it's, you know, I, I, it comes naturally from my dad. My, my dad would say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build or I'm going to tear something out. You better get out of his way. Because yeah, yeah. that wasn't like, hey, in six months. <laughs> it's like if they don't move quick enough, he's liable yeah. to go through the wall. Yeah. So I, I, I come yeah, I by it that. naturally. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have how, an impatient dad as well. <laughs> <laughs> how does running or waiting run counter to our culture? I mean, uh, it's just basically, we, we, live in a, <laughs> we live in an instantaneous kind of society. We want immediate results we want immediate satisfaction the diets we do are like man if i'm not if i'm gonna lost 20 pounds by next week then this is this is a waste um but yeah i think so much plays into that not all necessarily bad but um technology man you can have information at your fingertips you don't have to wait till the nightly news to to get news it's just everything is Everything is there, instant gratification. And so this idea of waiting for anything really runs, again, waiting for 25 minutes for food when you can have it in five minutes at, at Chipotle um, or even less at McDonald's. Um, yeah, it's tough, to, it's tough to wait in a society like ours, for sure. I think we also have this idea that we just have a lot of self-agency where like we can just make things happen. Yeah. And so it's like, well, if this is taking too long, well, I'll just make something else happen. I'll just do something mm -hmm. else. Yeah. And like that you shouldn't necessarily encounter those wait times because you should just be able just to keep on going and keep on doing. And so, yeah, that idea of, of running into an obstacle or having to wait is almost like, well, you're maybe just not trying hard enough. You're not <laughs> pushing hard enough. You're not yeah. doing what you need to do. Hmm. You know, and I, I think if that translates into our, and it's one thing to, to want to lose weight quick or eat quick or, you know, correct your finances quickly, right. you know, that, but spiritual, spiritually speaking, in our, in our faith development, when we rely upon an instant emotion mm -hmm. instead of process, mm -hmm. I think we miss, miss the beauty of what God wants to do in our midst. And yeah. I think you, you miss... Uh, you know, th that's that's when okay, I, I need this change. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the altar and I'm gonna pray for 15 minutes. I'm gonna be real urgent about it. When maybe God wants you to connect into community and mm -hmm. and allow yeah. community to do the hard work mm -hmm. of of forming in you something new. Yeah. Um. You, you know, to to do spirituality right takes time. Sure. Mm -hmm. To to do this relationship with God right uh, takes time. And uh, it, it, it's, not, it's not say the right word and, and say the right prayer and everything. You, you know, there is, a, there, is a, there is a process that God works in his people. Mm -hmm. And he works it through, uh, you know, we're, we've been talking a lot about community and being better together. And we're going to talk more about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and small groups, conversation after conversation. Yeah. Um, and, and I think we miss the beauty of what God wants to do, do. long term. Uh, because we get so tied up in short term. Yeah, yeah, we've we've totally focused on that instant. Like I said the right words at the altar, and mm -hmm. then I got up, and everything was just everything was great, and I was where I wanted to be. And and I'm not discounting those those times by any means, but but the truth is, is it's a it is a process. It's a it's a waiting, actively waiting, not just sitting by and waiting. But but yeah, I think we have done a maybe a, a not as good job of focusing on that, that process um, because we focus so much on the, on the instant. Um, yeah, I was kind of thinking like when we drove to South Carolina last week, it's like, okay, well, we're, we're sitting and we'll be on the same road for a while. And then like we'd take a turn and like that was the right turn. In that moment, that was exactly what we should do. But if we weren't there yet, Nobody would sit there and be like, oh, I think I made the wrong turn. Like, I think yeah. we recognize that in so many other ways, like there is that aspect of like, we're here and then we're, we're turning mm -hmm. and then we're here. And then, um, but I think sometimes we don't give ourselves that same allowance in our spiritual life. We think, yeah. well, if I made that turn, I should, I should be somewhere different. I should be, I, I should feel different. I should, yeah. when we don't recognize that, well, yeah, you made that turn, you made that decision, but that sets you on a different trajectory. It yeah, doesn't right. necessarily mean that. Every problem, yeah. everything is going to just dissolve. Yeah, hmm. that's, and that's a good illustration. Just yeah. that the next right turn. Yeah, <laughs> that that oftentimes we're so focused on destination mm -hmm. 
uh, that we think everything will be right when you know we get this job, we yeah. get this or that or whatever. And so we're so focused on destination that we, we miss the beauty of the journey, the, mm -hmm. that, that the turns sure. and the and, yeah. and just the going straights yeah. and all the things you have to do to, to get to that point. Um, and, and most of life is journey, not yeah. destination. For sure. And, uh, yeah. and you have to wait in that. And yeah. there, there's a great deal of waiting yeah. in that. But, but your waiting isn't, like in that illustration, you're not just sitting in the middle of the road <laughs> going nowhere, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, like like the old video games of, of like a race where like the car is actually sitting still, <laughs> the graphics yeah, yeah, were yeah, moving. Yeah. No, that's not the way it works. Like you to get to that next right turn, you have to go. I'm just curious, so, are, are the new wait. graphics different? Do you move into the... <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> it's weird. But, yeah, you actually move. You're, yeah, it's like a 4D experience. That's cool. Yeah. Nice. Um, but yeah. also I can't drive my car with my eyes closed and just wait to get there and, yeah. and ignore everything that's going on around me. Right. Some cars you can't. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I don't Thank have that Thank you, car. Tesla. For, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, there's that, that component of waiting, but still it's an act of waiting. And I think we talked about that, I don't know, a few months ago. There's that act of waiting. Yeah. Not sitting by. Which, which I, you touched on in your sermon is Elijah was actively waiting. He didn't just stay there and do nothing. He served. He, he served this... Uh, this widow uh, and her son, um, even in the midst of, of his waiting, he was doing, he was, we don't have to just sit by idly and do nothing while we're waiting. And that's an interesting, you know, why did God change that? Uh, you know, the brook dried up. Mm -hmm. um, why, why did God put him in this place where he was serving someone else and he's waiting? I mean, it, it, there was an intentional thing, yeah. I think, going on there that I think it's a lesson for us, number one. I think it was a it's not just a lesson for us. It was a lesson for Elijah that, that Elijah needed those words that he heard from the widow at the end of the story. I now know you are a man of God. Yeah. And uh, yeah. he, he needed to hear, those were the words that were going to launch him sure. into first Kings 18 and uh, where, where mm. he's going to have this great battle with the prophets of Bel. Yeah. How, how does waiting develop faith? I hadn't really thought about it until you just mentioned the fact that like, okay, so he's a prophet and he had just gone to King Ahab and Jezebel and I mean, basically gave them super bad news. And like, so there had to be that time where he's like going, like almost that, am I, am I really a prophet? Like, am I, <laughs> is God really working through me? And so like, I wonder if his time spent by like the creek with the ravens, like was almost like a time of, of healing for him, like a time of just kind of being alone, being with, with God. And that kind of prepared him. Okay, well then he's going to go and serve mm. the widow and in her faith, seeing her faith reflected back at him, kind of provided that healing into like the okay, like God gave me a pretty terrible news and pre like a pretty terrible word for the people, but like even through that, like people are coming to faith and people are realizing. And I think that does kind of bolster him then to act then in in the next chapter when he ends up going up against the other priests of Baal. Like he had already seen how even in a small thing, God had worked to bring about faith. But you know, he's he's fragile. Um, because even after this great battle with the prophets of Bel, where he has this huge victory, mm -hmm. he runs from Jezebel. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and when, when God finally speaks to him, what he says is, I'm the only one. Yeah. <laughs> so so there's, a, a, there's something about Elijah that's, and, and you know, you can say, oh, well, it's big spiritual victory, but there seems to be almost this fragile part mm. of his personality sure. uh, and as a matter of fact that's one of the the correctives that god uh, places in his life he says no you're not the only one and you're not going to be by yourself anymore go get elisha <laughs> and, and bring him along as a partner yeah. and, and, I, and i think it goes to what we talked about earlier i mean i, I think we have in our mind this amazing prophet mm -hmm. well there's a bit of fragile personality mm -hmm. that god's sure. using yeah. regardless um, and even even with this encounter with the widow, um, I don't know. They're, they're, it doesn't come through as this great confident prophet when the son dies. Yeah, right. Right. It's almost like, what did I do? What, what's going on here? Yeah. Um, so it's kind of an interesting yeah. that you, yeah. you you mentioned the personality uh, of of Elijah. Yeah. I was just thinking of this idea of waiting. Um, and then Elijah kind of taking it. It just it reminded me of Sabbath a lot. Like there's this, there are these periods of of waiting, and Sabbath is a is a really is a waiting thing, but also a trusting that 
um, even in my waiting, as I take a step back, things are still, God is still at work. And, and so, so Sabbath really requires kind of a faith that everything is not dependent on me. And so, um, so that time of just healing of stepping back and, and saying, you know, this isn't about me. This isn't about me fixing things. Um, just that Sabbath, that taking a step back really requires faith that in my waiting, God is still working. And so then you turn that, Jesus said, Sabbath was not created for God, but for man. Hmm. So waiting is not for God, but for us. Yeah, uh, for it, sure. It's something, it, it creates something within us that will not happen otherwise. Um, yeah. Much like, like Sabbath. Right. What other thoughts you guys have? I think sometimes the waiting is the quiet. It's, um, and I think when we encounter the, the chaos and the noise and when lots of things are happening, that's when it's hardest to really focus and, and hear and, mm -hmm. and like really see God at, at work because you can just see everything else happening. So I think sometimes when you have those moments where it's like you kind of clear, clear the stage, you clear everything away, those are those moments where there's almost nothing else to pay attention to but God. Yeah. And I think that those are times when my faith has grown the most is just when I don't feel like I have anything else going for me right now, but God. Hmm. And um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't. Yeah. That's yeah. Cause, and, but then we, and we try, our tendency is to rush through those things. Mm -hmm. Like give me the next, the next thing that's going to get me over this, this, uh, this hump of where I'm at or whatever to the next level, as opposed to just, taking that waiting period and seeing it as an opportunity where it's, yeah, all the distractions are gone. That's well, because often those are the most like uncomfortable times. Those are the times sure. you're, in, you're, you're in pain. I mean, obviously you don't want to stay there. Definitely. But, um, hmm. but yeah. Yeah, particularly he's in Gentile land. Mm -hmm. You know, he's with, um, he's not even home. He's yeah. not where he, you know, customs wouldn't be comfortable to him. You know, yeah. they, they, they wouldn't be kosher. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, here he is waiting in that and it, and it feels like in my life there's been lots of times even even right now i would say this is a time of waiting in what feels like foreign land yeah it, yeah, it doesn't right. it's it's not natural it's yeah. not comfortable yeah. it's it's you know i feel i feel like i'm in a period of waiting even in my life yeah. Yeah. and um yeah. it, it's hard to, to see god yeah. in the way um, true but i think you can mm -hmm. Uh, what was it? You, you, you used the phrase when you know everything's kind of fading away, and the the, the heart of worship song oh, came yeah. to my mind. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, when the music, the music fades and all yeah. stripped away, and I simply come, yeah. um, you know, yeah. wait. Hey, I don't know the lyrics yeah. well enough, <laughs> <laughs> but but you know, just that ideal of okay, let's strip all the stuff yeah. away, yeah. and um, God, even in this moment of waiting, I, I want to hear from you, mm -hmm. and and I want to see you. And um, I do believe it's true that, that I've experienced more of God in my waiting than my going. Mm -hmm. uh, because usually in the going, you, you know, you have that yeah. energy and you're it's excited incredible. about what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I, feel, sure. I feel his embrace more yeah. in those times. Yeah, for sure. What do you think it's important for teenagers to learn about waiting, Josh? Uh, I think, I just, I think in, in conversations with teenagers um, and remembering myself as a teenager, uh, there's always this like, well, what am I going to do after this? Or what, you know, it's, this is all like your teenage years is, is preparing and then, and then even college is like it's preparing you for your final like, this is what I'm going to do. This is what God is calling me to do. And we can get so caught up and focused on, on that big thing that we, we totally miss that God wants to use us now where we're at. Um, but but we just we miss the significance of of that waiting. So I guess my, my encouragement would be, um, in the midst of, and it's important to think about the future. Obviously, <laughs> like it, it's important to think about that. It's important to think through that. But don't miss where you're at right now. Like that. This is where God has you. This is a time of of preparation. This is a time of of waiting. But it's also a time that God wants to use you in significant ways and so finding those ways that god wants to use you god wants to speak to you um that wouldn't happen if you weren't if we weren't kind of waiting um yeah yeah we didn't get to see 
Mara was with the kids in second service, and you, what 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 did you focus on with the kids with Elijah here? Oh, we talked just a lot about how um, how God takes care of us, like how He knows what we need before we even do it, which is why it was so difficult sometimes even thinking and making those lists of all the things we need because. God has kind of placed each of these kids in a family and their parents are meeting a lot of those needs for them and they don't even really think about the fact that they wake up every day and yeah, there's there's cereal to eat, the heat's on, like those kinds of things that we can so easily take for granted because yeah. someone someone else is just providing them for us and it almost it almost appears magical. I mean, when you're a kid and like, you're like, well, sure. everything, like I don't have to do anything really. Yeah. Of course and, there's cookies in the pantry. Right, right. <laughs> And so I think sometimes even like this idea of waiting for, for kids is like, I don't know that like Emerson has many existential moments where he's like <laughs> contemplating what is he waiting for? And if, if only his life will begin, like, I feel like kids except are, except for Christmas. Except, <laughs> yeah. So waiting like, I feel like Christmas. they're, yeah, they're waiting is more attached to like an event or something specific yeah. that's coming up. Um, yeah, that's right. But I was thinking more in terms of like, even in parenting though, I feel like we kind of often catch, at least I catch myself going like, oh, I'm just waiting for, for this season to be over. So like, true. man, this is so hard right now. I'm just so waiting true. to see, I'm waiting to see what nine looks like because eight's been kind of a doozy at times. Like, <laughs> and I, um, you catch yourselves and like, mm. we have this phrase like living in survival mode. Yep. And a few years ago, I read this article and it just really like, it really checked my heart in that idea that like, it, I'd used that phrase before. I'm like, oh, we're just really in survival mode over here. <laughs> yeah. And this, this article, and I wish I had kept it, but it was talking about how survival mode means you're just literally trying to get through. You're just literally waiting for it to be over. And they're like, and do you want to look back at your life and know that you lived it just waiting for mm. it to be over? Just waiting for this, for like, so instead of being in survival mode, they're like, sometimes even just thinking about like, we can still thrive in this moment, even if it's hard, even if it, and so like this idea of waiting, if we're like, okay, well, if I look at it of waiting and I just need to get through it, that's a totally different approach to just, this is my moment. This is where I'm at. How does God want me to live here? Hmm. That's good. That's good. Well, any other thoughts? My heart is clear. Your heart is clear? Okay. Well, um, well, I can't wait till next week. I see what, anyway, yeah, I see what I did there. Yeah. It's going to be amazing. Ready, guys? Yeah, amazing. Uh, Jazz hands. There we go. There we go. Okay. Let me pray us out. We got to end this thing. <laughs> Lord, thank you uh, for the story of Elijah. But Lord, most of all, thank you that you're still at work in our life. As we consider this story, it's not some ancient history that has no application. But in this story, we see our God at work, like he's at work in our life. You sustain, you provide, you protect, you guide. And Lord, you ask us to wait on you. Uh, Lord, help us to wait. And in our waiting, Lord, may our faith grow stronger. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless. See y'all.